Good morning, Mr. Robertson. Good morning. Pleased to see you again. Glorious day. It is that. Good morning, Mr. Robertson. Glad to see you again. How do you do, sir? Had a good voyage? Very nice, thanks. Uh, the deviations have increased a little. They're a little erratic. We'll soon put that right. Can I have a look at the book? Yes. Where do you get the oscillation, Captain? Oh, let me see. It'll be just after passing the equator. About 10 degrees south latitude. Mm -hmm. It looks very much like healing error. I'll check it then, Clement. Here are the military keys, Mr. Robertson. Mr. Malcolm will see that you have everything you want. Thank you. Very good, sir. Open the medical doors, will you? Certainly, sir. Pilot, I'd like you to steer an 80 degree course to the adjusting area. Aye, aye, sir. This was all calculated up by Kelvin, wasn't it? It was. Pilot, starboard 10 degrees to east. Aye, aye, sir. And so was the sounding machine and the depth gauge. Steady as you go. Aye, aye, sir. And the tide predictor. Not to mention a host of other measuring devices. Wasn't he a professor at Glasgow University? Mm-hmm. Funny for a chap like that to invent navigational instruments. Oh, no. Not funny, really. You see, in the first place, he lived... Steady as you go. Aye, aye, sir. He lived at sea whenever he could. And in the second place, he was a great mathematician and a great measurer. In fact, he believed that science is measurement. 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 Consider motion. All motion is relative motion. We can calculate from astronomical data the direction in which and the velocity with which we are moving at any instant by first compounding the known velocity of the rotation of the Earth round its axis with a known motion round the Sun. The resultant motion having been accurately determined, we have then to compound it with the roughly known velocity of the sun in space. How much longer but is it going on? Even if this were accurately known, it would not give us our absolute velocity in space. For it is only the sun's relative motion among the stars that we can observe. In all probability, the sun, moon and stars are moving with inconceivably great velocities relative to other bodies in the universe. It's easy to procure the relative motion by the, by the simple device of impressing upon all the moving bodies a velocity equal and opposite to the velocity of the one about which the relative motion is to be found. In 2,000 years, tidal friction has quite an appreciable effect on the length of the day. A 
And there I shall stop this morning. Dear me, I could have sworn there were more here when I started. I think you went on a little long, sir. Did I? Good gracious, more than an hour. And I was due at White's at 12. He's promised to have that new electrometer ready for me. Well, here we are, James. Sorry to be so late. How's the work coming on? Good morning, Professor. Oh, everything is perfect now. Good. Oh, dear me. Those modifications to the meter that we decided on were all that were necessary. Run for a drop more milk, will you please? Yes, sir. And now I hope you'll be quite satisfied. Hmm. Very nice. Very nice. By the way, I've got an order for two more of these. Shall I put it in hand? Two more, eh? Mm-hmm. Well, we'd better form a company and go into partnership, James. Professor Thompson and James White? No, I think just Thompson and White. Thompson and James White? All right. Have it your own way. Yes, was it? Letter for you, sir. Oh, thank you. Listen to this. It's from the directors of the, of the Atlantic Telegraph Company. They want me to go out in the Agamemnon in an honorary capacity to advise in the laying of the transatlantic cable. Mr. Whitehouse, the electrician, is unfortunately unable to make the voyage. Hmm. Will you go? Of course I shall go. Is your milk set? Hmm? Oh, thank you. Uh, you were saying the other day that you weren't at all satisfied with the haphazard way the cable was made. I'm not. I've told them so. No proper tests. No specifications. And as to the conductivity of the copper, in short, no accurate measurements. No. No accurate measurements. And what is science but measurement? Still, it may be all right. What a wonderful thing if it does succeed. An electric cable across the Atlantic. A cable across the Atlantic. Victorian society of the day, which was barely accustomed to the railway train, was skeptical. Cable across the Atlantic. Messages across the Atlantic. I don't believe it. Three hundred and fifty thousand pounds capital. Yes, I'll buy some shares. But I say, hey, don't touch it. Damn it, sir. It's a lot of rubbish. Dear me, but won't it get wet? The Agamemnon. Uh, meets the Niagara here at Valencia. The Niagara lays the shore end of the cable, steams away, paying out as she goes. Now, halfway across, the Agamemnon splices on her end of the cable and thus completes the laying of the second half. Very good. Thank you.
a look at these induction coils, Professor. They may work, but in my opinion, these heavy induction coils producing currents of high potential will subject the insulation of the cable to an unnecessary strain. What then is your idea of the proper principle? The proper principle is to use a lower potential and a more sensitive instrument at the receiving end. Forgive me, Professor, but you're not a practical man. Mr. Whitehouse agrees with me that these induction coils are essential. You have just received a flag signal from the Niagara, sir. After paying out 350 miles, the cable has parted. to conduct certain tests of the new cable at the factory of the manufacturers at your earnest request, Professor Thompson. And we've also agreed to include the conductivity clause in the specification. But the board cannot see its way clear to grant you the sum of money you require for your instruments, which in the opinion of Mr. Whitehouse, our chief electrician, are quite unnecessary. Very well. I shall go down to the workshop and begin my tests as soon as possible. I quite agree with you, Professor. I discovered when I tested the cable that even a 2% impurity in the copper caused a variation of as much as 60% in the conductivity of the cable. Well, that's over and done with, and I had my way. Now, what's your opinion of this galvanometer Helmholtz sent us? Well, it's a beautiful instrument. But I'm not happy about that heavy magnet movement. Neither am I. We want something much lighter. Something as light as light. And yesterday morning, I think I hit upon the very idea. We'll make the indicator out of a beam of light. No. I noticed it when I was lecturing the other morning, reflected on the blackboard. We'll improve this galvanometer of old Helmholtz. We'll mount the mirror on a very light magnet movement and make a mirror galvanometer. A mirror? A mirror galvanometer? Mm -hmm. And so, when the next attempt to lay the cable was made, the mirror galvanometer was among the instruments on board the Agamemnon. A mirror galvanometer? Yes. Yes, it's very interesting, but I still consider it unsuitable for the work we have to do. Mr. Whitehouse would agree with me if he were here. I think it's extraordinary that he isn't. This is the second time he's failed to accompany the expedition. And now, gentlemen, let us follow the progress of our venture. 1858. The Agamemnon and Niagara sail on June 10th. On June 12th, a heavy storm battles the Agamemnon. Crew engine, cable damaged. July 1st, cable repaired. July 10th, cable breaks three times in 80 miles. Ships meet and splice cable. August 5th, both ships land their ends. 
The cable is laid. Transmitted by cable to America. The President of the United States has replied to the message of our most gracious Queen. Buy me cable stock at any price. Any price. The cable. The cable. The cable. The cable works. It works. Demi, sir. I told you it was a good idea. But was it a good idea? Gentlemen, may I briefly recapitulate the unfortunate history of the past few weeks? The trouble began on the 8th of August, when signals became faint and distorted. On the 13th, the message sent by our most gracious Queen to the President of the United States, containing 90 words, took 16 and a half hours to transmit. While he came back from Newfoundland, in 67 minutes. Mr. Whitehouse decided there was a fault in the cable and against our express orders had the cable raised to look for it. In September we asked Professor Thompson to go to Valencia to investigate on our behalf. He found that not only had Mr. Whitehouse substituted his own apparatus for that of uh, Professor Thompson it also subjected the insulation of the cable to great strain by the use of heavy induction coils. Moreover, his instruments were quite unable to receive messages. And, and while he gave us to understand he was using his own instruments, he'd secretly put back into use one of Professor Thompson's mirrored galvanometers. Of course, man. Man. Stop. 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 Man. Professor Thompson is a, a kindly man. And he's done his best to shield our chief electrician. But in the circumstances, the company had no other alternative but to dismiss Mr. Whitehouse. Quite right, sir. I thought under the circumstances, the best thing was to say as little as possible. The whole affair was very regrettable. However, I am firmly convinced that before many years have passed, we shall find a new cable laid and working. Good gracious, it sounds as though there's a large class this morning. And a noisy one. I think word got round, sir. Oh? Word of what? That you're going to do the Robbins ballistic pendulum experiment, sir. They always like you to fire the guns. Between you and me, I like it myself. Today, we continue our consideration of velocity with the aid of Robin's ballistic pendulum. As I explained in my last lecture, the bullet fired from the gun strikes the pendulum. The movement of the pendulum is measured there on the tape. The gun won't go off. I've taken the charge out. <laughs> and now, gentlemen, you will observe that the pendulum remains at rest thus demonstrating Newton's first law of motion.
And in concluding the last lecture for this term, gentlemen, let me say that the principle of the gyroset is perfectly simple. It is merely a matter of generation of moment of momentum perpendicular to the axis of the rotator. A numerical exercise on this principle will be set on paper on the first Monday morning of next term. Yeah. And now, gentlemen, let me wish you a very happy vacation. Here's the professor. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Professor Thompson. Well, here we are, James. And that's the end of another term. I brought Mr. Jewell with me this afternoon. Ah, is it a new colorimeter you're after? No, no. <laughs> no, I want to show him how our new siphon recorder works. Ah, so that's it, eh? Aye, hey, that's it. It's all ready. You see, receiving telegraph signals is a great visual strain on the operator. And we hope that this will do it for him. Here are two upright permanent magnets, between the upper ends of which swings the signal coil. This moves that little glass tube, which is really an ink siphon. Now, under the tip of the tube, but not touching it, runs the tape. Here. Now we electrify the ink, and it is attracted to the tape, causing a continuous record without friction. This is deflected to left or right by the movements of the coil, thus causing a permanent record of the signal to be made. Well, Sandy, would you agree that I have made an accurate explanation? Oh, yes, sir. Indeed, sir. <laughs> mm. Highly ingenious. It's a pity it can't be used on the transatlantic cable. Hmm? Well, it uh, may be very soon, you know. The project has been revived. Well, this is a delightful surprise. And how are you, William? How do you do, William? Hi, Fleming. And how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Fleming Jenkins, do you know uh, Mr. Jewell? Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Mm -hmm. Professor Fleming Jenkins, my colleague. How do you do? How do you do? Well, has Fleming brought you to see the new recorder? Now, William, I knew you'd forget. That's why I brought a cab for you. But you're going to head down Pascale tonight. And I don't want you rushing along at the last minute, as usual. Ah, Donizetti, Italian music. I thought you preferred Wagner. <laughs> Thereby hangs a tale. We had a box at the opera, and William arrived very late. Just in time for the end of the first act. That was beautiful. But William, that was Italian music. Hmm, very. But it was very beautiful, and I was wrong. And as William's going away again next month, tonight will be his last opportunity to hear Don Pascale. Yes. I sail in the Great Eastern in July, with Varley as one of my collaborators. Ah, you must have arranged it to suit the end of term. <laughs> oh, no. It's just a matter of good weather in the Atlantic. <laughs> now come along, William. There's just time to dress and have our dinner before the opera. Come along. Good night. Good night. <laughs> good night. <coughs> good night to you all.
By the time next term starts, we shall either have failed again or succeeded for good. So the days went by and the waves rolled on. Once more, the ships set out across the Atlantic. One night, James White was sitting in his workshop as usual. Good night, sir. Good night. Yesterday, the shore end of the transatlantic cable was laid. Is this not a remarkable achievement for the city of Glasgow? Is not Captain Anderson one of her most gallant sons? Is not Professor Thompson the great electrician at Glasgow man? And were not the instruments made in the workshop of James White, the Glasgow optician? Aye. Aye, they were that. He'll soon be getting messages across the Atlantic. Aye, uh, that's right, laddie. Thompson! 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 So perseverance and courage were rewarded. Professor Thompson knelt before Queen Victoria and became Sir William Thompson. Very well, thank you. Had a nice trip. Are you finished with the boat, sir? Uh, yes, thank you, Johnson. Well, I've been a long time getting you aboard the Lala Rook. I think you know Monsieur Dabou. Enchanté, monsieur. Well, we'll have a great time together over the weekend. We'll sail up the Kyles of Butte to find your sea legs. Then we'll take a trip up the west coast. Oh, I say, be careful, will you? Another invention? Yes, indeed. You see, it's a contrivance I'm working out for depth sounding. Just a glass tube, open one end and close the other. Coated inside with chromate of silver. It's attached to a sinker, you see. The increased pressure at the bottom forces the seawater up the tube, which discolors the lining. You simply read off the depth by laying the tube against the scale. I'm working out the measurements for the scale now. And what's this? That? Oh, that's just piano wire. He's working on harmonic. <laughs> what note are you trying to sound? <laughs> I'm trying to sound the deep sea. <laughs> <laughs> this is all part of my depth sounder. I propose using this instead of rope. It offers less resistance to the water and sinks more easily when the ship's traveling at speed. But come and see my wife, she's below. And then I'll show you to your cabin. I'm sure you must be tired after your journey. Thank you, John. What a lucky fellow you are. Not that you don't deserve your good fortune, 
But you, university professors, succeed as you have done. Your scientific achievements have brought you not merely academic fame, but wealth and honor. Oh, my dear fellow. You have a lovely yacht. And a charming wife. And a very restless spirit. Thank you. Sugar? No, thank you. Yes. I may have succeeded in the little things, but so far I have failed in my attempts to measure the bigger dimensions of matter, of life. You are not trying to measure the infinite, are you, by any chance? For a mathematician, you are becoming very like a theologian. Perhaps I am. What's that? A model of the universe? Oh, no. It's just another one of my uh, contrivances. <laughs> it's a compass card. I'm making a new sort of compass. I started to write an article on the compass. That was two years ago, and you never finished it. <laughs> you see, I suddenly realized that the compass was a hopelessly clumsy and inaccurate instrument. Too heavy. A prey to stray magnetic fields of all kinds. So I'm making a light compass card and working out ways and means of neutralizing every magnetic field but that of the Earth. Well, we are sailing at daybreak and I do so love to be on deck when we weigh anchor. So if you'll excuse me, I'll retire early. Good night. Good night, Lady Thompson. Good night. Good night, Lady Thompson. Good night, my dear. Sleep well. Good night, my dear. You will succeed, of course. Probably, but it will take me a year or two. I wish I could be assured of success in the larger problems that confront me. A perfect compass is as close to theology as a mathematician can hope to get. Yes, I agree with you. The essential feature is like this. The center of the card is cut away and support is provided by threads radiating from the pivot. The magnetic element is eight light steel needles placed parallel to each other and threaded together like a rope ladder. I see. I have provided means of eliminating completely the distortion of the magnetic field due to outside influence. You will see the obvious advantage with the new iron battleships now coming into vogue. Yes, very interesting. Very interesting. We shall have to go into this matter seriously. Well, sir, good morning. Thank you very much. We'll let you know. After years of trial and delay, the Admiralty does adopt the Kelvin compass. Thompson supports Joule in his theory of the mechanical equivalent of heat. Thompson publishes the treatise on natural philosophy in conjunction with Professor Tate of Edinburgh. Thompson suggests harnessing Niagara Falls for electric power. Thompson experiments with the liquid compass. Thompson interests himself in Bell's telephone. Thompson installs the first incandescent electric light in Scotland. Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore. Sir William Thompson lectures on the wave theory of light. Sir William Thompson, president of the Royal Society and three times president of the Institution of Electrical Engineers, created first Baron Kelvin of Largs in the county of Ayr. I may have measured some paltry forces, but the real problems, these I haven't yet solved. I have measured certain dimensions of matter, yes, but the constitution of matter itself, 
That is a problem which I have utterly failed. His obsession of having failed. Yes. I think he's part of the modest makeup of a really great man. Possibly. A distinguished career at the university, an international reputation, numerous inventions to benefit his fellow men. You know, that's the way I'd like to fail myself. As it is, every ship that sails the seas carries with her a dozen different instruments invented by his genius. That genius for measurement, which is the mark of a great man of science. So, Kelvin's work goes on. For even if he had done nothing else but perfect the compass, he would still be a profound benefactor to his fellow men. Oh, well, good evening. Goodbye, Mr. Opperson. 